good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nandini Hari um, uh, part of the Technical Advisory Committee and uh, helping to co-facilitate this session with the fabulous Lucy Kadia, uh, based in Nairobi. Um, we are talking today about implementing climate smart solutions that work for women. Um, after lots of hard work, after a, a, a good number of members offering to share their solutions, we have selected three that are going to share their amazing experiences today. And we have three case studies that uh, Lucy is helping to lead and she'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, I am honored to give a little bit of the introduction to this session. Um, and I'm honored because I actually only recently became a climate change person. Uh, I've always said, okay, climate change is somebody else's job. But uh, increasingly I have felt it's kind of all of our jobs. Um, and so I have three points. So first is what makes this year kind of different from before. One is um, really climate change is life-changing, right? So the work that we do, the work that our colleagues do that are talking today and, and that we'll be sharing in the three case studies is really about saving lives. And I think we don't talk about that very much in the financial inclusion community. We don't talk about saving lives through financial resilience, but that's really what this is. Second, insurance matters. Right for a long time in the financial inclusion community, we've kind of put insurance aside as okay. When we get there, we'll kind of try to figure out how insurance can be, you know, included in the financial lives of those that are marginalized. But increasingly, when we talk about financial resilience, when we talk about climate resilience, almost a lot of the solutions, either one or more parts of these solutions, include indexed linked insurance. Right, weather index linked insurance. And and so I think this this is insurance's time to come forward and for us as a community to figure out how to make it work. And lastly is health insurance. Um, I think you you will see in in the examples today, and you will see in the case studies that Lucy is working on that health insurance and agriculturally related insurance are are themes that we keep seeing coming up. And if you read this amazing paper. Uh, by CGAP, by Sabanota and others, um, it really talks about how health is one of the most important secondary uh, issues around climate resilience. Second, why should we care, right? Um, I, I read this great book a year or two ago called The Ministry of the Future. I talk about it all the time to my colleagues. And it starts with a bang. It starts with a terrible thing that happens. It starts with a heat wave that kills 20 million people. And that kind of really sets things off to a different kind of future. And so my, in my mind, I wonder when I think about these things, how are we trying to prevent that from happening in the future with the tools that we have in the work that we do? Lastly, um, I wanted to say that these member shares and the case studies that Lucy is working on, uh, the takeaways we want you as members to have are this can be done, um, this can be done at scale, and this can be done sustainably in partnership with private sector. Um, and so it's my pleasure to introduce L Lucy Kadia, uh, one of our technical advisors to CGAP that's been working on the intersection of financial inclusion, women, and climate change for a long time, to introduce this session and also co-facilitate with me. Go ahead, Lucy. Thank you, Nadini, for starting us off with that uh, insightful background, why we need to intersect climate change, gender, and financial inclusion during program and product design and delivery. Again, welcome all to this session. We have three speakers uh, today, and each will take us uh, 10 minutes to talk us through a climate solution or approach that is building women resilience in times of climate change. They will take us through the why and how they built the specific product, program, or services. As, as Nandine mentioned, we had a lot of case studies that a lot of uh, member shares that we received, but we only had to select the three today because of time. And what we considered uh, when we were choosing these three solutions, uh, one of the key things that we wanted to see, what are they trying to solve? 
the scalability of the solution, innovation, and also we wanted to include the regional representation. Uh, also, we selected three other case studies that I'll be able to mention as we wrap up our, uh, on our uh, session today. After all our speakers have, have spoken, during the discussion, please use the chat box to, ch to send your specific and general questions and comments, and we'll be able to have a session when, where we'll be able to facilitate question and answer. And our first uh, speaker, sorry, our first speaker is Lorenzo Rovier. Lorenzo is the program specialist for women economic empowerment and innovation based at UN Women's Regional Office for West and Central Africa in Dakar. Lorenzo will speak to us about crop and health insurance products for women in Mali and Senegal, respectively. Welcome, Lorenzo. Lorenzo. We can't hear you. Is he here? You are mutant, Lorenzo. I can see you are mutant. Sorry. You are still muted. Okay, let me try to unmute Hello. you. Thank you. Thank Welcome. you, Lucy. <laughs> Thank you. I had a hard time uh, trying to unmute myself. Thank you very much and very glad to be here. The floor is yours, Lorenzo. Please take us through your, the, the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Um, so like I said, it's a great, great pleasure and honor um, to be here and to share some of the approaches uh, for gender responsive and, and climate uh, smart financial solutions for women that we have developed at UN Women in, in West Africa. And I will illustrate this through two projects, one in Senegal and one in Mali, uh, where we have worked with both public and private sector um, partners to design and to pilot gender responsive financial solutions. And in particular, I will um, present two insurance schemes that have been tailored to the needs and the constraints faced by rural women to strengthen their resilience to uh, climate change. So the first example uh, that I will show is an initiative that we have implemented in Mali, jointly with our sister agency, UNCDF, and with support from Innovation Norway, and where we have worked to develop uh, gender responsive crop insurance for women smallholders. Um, so in the next slide, uh, we will see a little bit the approach that we have taken. And this was an evidence-based approach. So what we did here was really, we tried first to identify uh, what are the most relevant mechanisms that are not just feasible uh, uh, within the country context, but also tailored to the specific needs uh, of women farmers, and that can help them to strengthen their resilience to climate shocks. So in a nutshell, uh, as we, what we found out is that the key challenges, or one of the key challenges faced by women farmers in Mali is that they regularly face um, harvest losses and therefore income losses. And these are mostly due to drought and also floods. Um, and then on the other hand, we also realized that while some agricultural insurance schemes already exist in Mali, this really mostly failed to address the, the specific needs uh, of, uh, of, of women. So to, to address this, um, we decided jointly to launch a competitive process to work with private sector partners. And this private sector partner ended up being uh, OCO. So many of you may be familiar with uh, OCO. This is a company that is already providing index-based insurance, uh, not just in Mali, but in other countries in Africa. Um, and now very briefly on index-based insurance, I would like to highlight um, that this is some quite interesting future. So unlike traditional insurance, it is not indemnity-based. Uh, it is based on parameters like rainfall, for example, or, or vegetation index. And that so and those parameters are mostly um, generally measured uh, through, through remote sensing, so through satellite. And this has huge advantages also in terms of cost because there is no need for an assessment of the actual losses incurred by the farm. Um, and so the the farmer, the customer, has a, a big advantage in terms of basically they receive automatically a payout. Um, if agreement, if a given uh, threshold is uh, is met, uh, whether it's a rainfall threshold or any other threshold, and so that really, um, so there's no need for them to submit a claim. So that obviously has a massive, uh, makes massive interest in terms of women smallholder farmers with little financial literacy. Now, the only drawback, or one of the main drawbacks of crop uh, index-based crop insurance is that a separate insurance product needs to be developed for each different crop because different crops have different um, thresholds. And that's one of the key aspects here um, as part of this project. So 
uh, in the next slide, we can see um, the approach this was that was jointly taken by ourselves, UNCDF and OCO. So first we carried out a survey among 330 women farmers to better understand what are they growing, what are their preferences in terms of payment modalities, etc. And then based on all of these um, outcomes of this assessment, we realized that the key measures that could be put in place to tailor OCO's insurance scheme to the women's preferences and needs were, first of all, to better balance uh, the OCO's workforce in terms of hiring and training um, a team of female insurance agents. Uh, secondly, uh, to include aspects of uh, gender in, in the trainings that are delivered to all of these insur insurance agents, male and women. And that could be as simple as understanding the different um, time use uh, uh, between women and men. So what's the best time of the day, for example, to reach out to women farm to, um, to talk to them about crop insurance? And finally, uh, we have designed and implemented a new insurance product for a, a crop that is dominated by women in Mali. And that turned out to be peanuts through the results from the, from the um, assessment. And in the next few slides, we'll see some of the uh, results of this, of this uh, approach. So as we can see from the first uh, one here on the graph on the left, uh, the idea of setting up a team of female agents proved to be quite successful uh, to reach women. Um, almost two thirds of the policies that were sold by this team were actually sold to women farmers. And this ratio, if you look at the top bar, is only is actually less than one fifth for the regular uh, sales teams. So big difference there. Um, and the next slide we can see um, from this pie chart, uh, the result of the crop um, of the peanut insurance product. And this also turned out to be a good approach because over 70% of the policies that were sold for this product were actually sold to women. Um, the figures for the other crops like cereals, for example, are not shown here, but they're usually much, much, much smaller. And so finally, uh, we can see in the next slide here uh, how the weekly gender gap evolved as the pilot project uh, was implemented. And you can see um, the blue bar, uh, no, sorry, the blue curve there starts very low, um, but it actually increases uh, as, uh, as the project is implemented, as these new approaches are implemented to reach about 50% of the weekly uh, weekly um, customers being hired, being women. So um, in the next slide, we can, we're putting all of this together and we have a look at the result from this um, pilot, which are first of all, 1100 <clears throat> women smallholders got to access uh, to crop insurance for the first time. And I would like to add uh, without um, a subsidy. <clears throat> and um, of course, new jobs were created for rural women in a very non-traditional sector like crop insurance. And for the point of view of OCO, uh, they were able to reduce their gender gap across their customer base uh, by increasing the share of women from 18 to 25% in, in one year. Um, so those are the main results from the first example. I will now, in this, through the next slides, very briefly cover the second example, where we have worked on the um, development of gender responsive health insurance for rural women in Senegal, uh, with the support from the government of Canada. And so similarly to the previous case, uh, we followed a similar uh, evidence-based approach to see what are the potential mechanisms that could strengthen the resilience of rural women in Senegal. So I won't go into the details, but essentially here again, we had a research phase. And as part of that, one of the main findings was that uh, rural women are very interested in instruments uh, to help them to build their resilience. Uh, particularly financial and social protection services, and health insurance uh, was the, the came out came up as being the, the most interesting for them. Eighty five percent were interested in a mechanism like this one, and uh, and that's because health insurance coverage for them, but also for their children, their family members, would give them a way to reduce their of course their health related expenses, and of course to make them more prone to seek professional healthcare services which also has an impact on their time poverty and they're reducing their unpaid care work. And this is even more important in a context where their health is being impacted by climate change, for example, in terms of diseases like linked to higher temperatures or floods. 
But um, another aspect that we saw, it's in the previous slide, but I'll try to accelerate as I think I, I'm going a little bit late. As you can see there, the, the knowledge and the level of access of these services was actually very low. You can see only 7% of the women surveyed uh, among the 300 women surveyed had access to uh, health insurance. So to uh, try to address this challenge, we decided to join hands with the National Agency for Universal Health Coverage in Senegal, which is called SEMU, um, to make health insurance more accessible, more affordable, and more better tailored to, to rural women. And so in the next slide, we can see how we did that. So uh, we try to approach the supply angle, but also the demand and the financing of the services. So uh, we work with SEMU to um, tailor the offer and the delivery of services, uh, for example, via incentive uh, arrangements. Uh, these were made possible to group membership. And we leverage the fact that rural women are often organized in cooperatives in, in Senegal. Um, the second aspect is we strengthen the knowledge of, insu of health insurance of women and therefore their demand for the services. And we use the hybrid approach, so both traditional um, trainings, but also mobile-based trainings, which also led to some uh, quite, quite interesting results. And finally, more to ensure the uh, sustainability of the intervention, we worked with these women-led co-ops to identify some suitable mechanisms that would help them to continue to finance the payment of the premium, such as, for example, through savings groups. And all of that together uh, led, as part of this pi uh, pilot, uh, the same to enroll 1,300 uh, rural women and their family members, leading uh, to a total of approximately 7,000 people having access to um, health insurance. So um, I will finish my intervention with some uh, key takeaways from this experience. So it's mostly, mostly three key takeaways. The first one, um, we see two critical factors to build solutions that actually work for women. Uh, and one is a thorough analysis of the needs, preferences, but also the constraints that women are facing. And that is critical by implementing, uh, sorry, by collecting sex disaggregated, qualitative and quantitative data, but also to involve them in the design and also the piloting of the of the solutions and collect their feedback. Um, the second aspect is the innovative partnerships, like the one that we, you know, um, tested here. I would say between developing partners and service providers, uh, it can really lead to a, a huge value addition in terms of um, making existing financial solutions more uh, gender responsive and better tailored to the needs and preferences of of women. And finally, uh, a very important point is that this gender responsive approaches, uh, of course, they bring obvious benefits uh, in terms of women's access to, to critical financial and social protection um, services, but they actually make very good business sense for the private sector or for the providers themselves. Uh, they provide them access to a mostly untapped market. So this is critical, uh, as we have seen for the case of FOCO, um, for example. And, and to finish in terms of perspectives, just to mention that beyond scaling up access to insurance for women, another key issue that we want to tackle uh, at UN Women in, in the region is the gender gap in access to green finance. So actually currently with support with uh, of um, the Irish government, we are currently adapting this approach that I've shown to develop gender responsive green finance products. So for women led uh, cooperatives in, in West Africa. So that's our next challenge. And uh, I hope I wasn't too long. Uh, thank you. It's okay. Thank you, Lorenzo. We'll move to our second speaker. Her name is Soline Frav. Soline is the Global Insurance Director with Vision Fund International. Soline will speak to us on how they are implementing insurance product through microfinance institution, building women resilience to climate shocks across Africa and Asia. You will hear more about Vision Fund International Recovery Lending Program and uniqueness to cover a vast area revealing world vision uh, footprints. Welcome, Suleen. Thank you, Lucy. Um, so uh, as noted by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, women, especially those in poverty, face a higher risk and experience a greater burden of climate change um, uh, impacts. This is, of course, notably true for health impacts, 
making climate change a risk multiplier for gender-based uh, health disparities. Um, to validate this statement from the UNFCCC, I would like to take you uh, on a journey to Uganda, where World Vision did a study on a nutrition crisis in a warming world in 2022. This uh, study shows how connected is the climate uh, crisis to human health, especially for women and girls. Overexposure of women to carbon uh, monoxide as they prepare food using non-efficient cook stoves exposes them to respiratory and cardiovascular diseases, secondary to exposure to poor air quality lung infections. As part of her own daily chores, she is also responsible for collecting water and wood in extreme heat temperatures, endangering uh, her health. Breastfeeding mothers feed their babies outside wet nets exposing them to vector-borne illnesses like malaria. As I take you back from the reality of a uh, lived life of a woman, a wife, and a mother from Uganda, I'm sure you, are, you can all agree with me that addressing climate change is even more urgent than before. Um, our vision for every child, life in all its fullness, informs our programmatic and financial inclusion approaches as World Vision and Vision Fund to addressing climate change health impacts on women, on girls, thus contributing to Sustainable uh, Development Goal 3. Vision Fund is set up to support World Vision uh, programs to lift families out of poverty through the power of financial inclusion for, for over 20 years. Uh, Vision Fund has focused through the of, um, uh, has focused on delivering quality microfinance products that promote financial inclusion in rural areas. So today I'm very pleased uh, to share with you a few existing World Vision and Vision Fund projects that contribute to climate adaptation with direct benefits to women and girls. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Yeah. So recognizing that climate change is an underlying driver of poverty and gender inequality and social exclusion, World Vision and Vision Fund are implementing an eight-year resilience building project referred to as uh, transforming household resilience in vulnerable environments. In short, Thrive 2030. This is what you have uh, on the screen uh, just here. Thrive is a package of evidence-based interventions focused on mindset change, collective action, financial inclusion, and local value chain development supported by an inclusive market system, laying a, a broad and solid foundation to empower those living in extreme poverty to progress up the economic ladder. This is what you have on the, on the right side. Um, firstly, Thrive 2030 empowers women with finances to make decisions on how to spend their earnings, including health, we do this um, through promoting savings group with, with, with World Vision. A savings group is a self-managed group of 15 to 25 people. 79% uh, uh, are women. Um, and this, uh, these people, these uh, savings group members, save and lend money to each other at an agreed monthly interest rate. However, we, we do recognize that as uh, members grow their small businesses, there is a need for more capital than what is available through the, the group alone. So that's why Vision Fund offers finance accelerating savings for transformation. In short, it's FAST. So the FAST loan that you have uh, in the orange box here on the top of the economic ladder. And these FAST loans are between 1,000 to 1,500 US dollars. And this is a loan that is provided to the savings group that have been working together for at least two years. Uh, beyond FAST, Thrive 2030 also provides other microfinance products. Um, for example, uh, we provide insurance products uh, such as life, health, accident, agriculture uh, insurance products that enable rural families to guard against emergencies, accidents, or impact of climate change. In addition, um, in support to uh, in support Thrive 2030 efforts and also in an alignment with the climate health um, intersection agenda, we um, we develop some climate smart innovative products for our smallholder household to mitigate or adapt to the impacts of climate change, such as investing in efficient energy, uh, such as biogas, efficient cook stoves, or solar energy. 
To support climate change adaptation and disaster preparedness efforts, Vision Fund also implements uh, insurance uh, products. So what you have on the screen here is the program RDs. In fact, it's it started um, in 2013 with a typhoon uh, Ayan, locally called Yolanda, and Vision Fund provided recovery landing to those whose livelihoods were destroyed by the typhoon in the Philippines in 2013. This is where we first develop our recovery landing approach when we saw that as most financial institutions in a disaster tend to just write off the loan or draw back, this is exactly uh, this was exactly the time uh, that our clients needed our support most. A targeted recovery loan ensure that clients open small stores and get back out earnings uh, for their families. We have seen that recovery, loan, recovery loans boosted clients' working capital so that they can restart their income uh, generating activities following an event. From this experience, we have learned four key learnings. The first one is that recovery lending uh, enabled rapid client recovery. The second one is recovery lending was affordable and did not lead to uh, overdebtness. The third one is um, that client repayments were very strong, meaning this made business sense also for the MFI. And the fourth one is that we need to prepare the before the event and have recovery products uh, ready to go. So this is where this is at the time at that time that we uh, developed the the RDS and in the face of these four learnings that we launched the RDS program in 2018. Uh, RDS is a disaster insurance scheme that enables the recovery lending practice to improve financial resilience of clients, but also uh, our institutions. We have four components under RDS: the credit component when credit becomes uncertain or unavailable. We have the cash component, cash payout. We have the climate data that um, aiding uh, business planning, and we have the catastrophe and recovery lending planning. And all these uh, four components, uh, through all these uh, four components, we could transform lives of our communities and institutions in the time of disaster. And you can see on the left side um, uh, the difference in terms of impact before RDIS when a disaster hits and, and, and after we implemented RDIS uh, when a disaster hits. So the restored clients uh, versus the damaged clients and also the growing MFI. The same approach was used uh, in the time of COVID um, with very positive outcome. A 60 decibel survey um, conducted in Kenya just after COVID shows that 91% of people say that their uh, quality of life has improved um, through this recovery lending methodology. 88% uh, declare they use their loans to grow or even to start uh, a new business. And 92% said that uh, there was no other product available to them to help them recover the, their business after the effects of the lockdown and the COVID. My third example is from the insurance products. Um, so yeah, if you, yes. Uh, my third example is uh, um, from the insurance products that we have developed in the past uh, five years in Vision Fund for our microfinance clients. And now we are extending out to offer to World Vision and also to other uh, partner beneficiaries. So we conducted uh, field surveys in 12 countries all showing the same results, being fully aligned with uh, WHO, our World Health uh, Organization, and World Bank statistics, like health is a priority, even in countries where there is a national scheme in place. Our Vision Fund International Insurance Team provides uh, technical assistance to MFI, but now also to World Vision entities and some other partners who would like to, to benefit from this technical assistance. And to, to define the needs, to understand the needs of the beneficiaries, to co-design an insurance product, to select a local provider. Vision Fund is not becoming an insurance company, so to select the, the right uh, local provider, to prepare the implementation, to train and educate staff, but also beneficiaries, clients, and then launch and monitor the performance in countries where we have a microfinance bank, but also in countries where we don't have any presence as Vision Fund. Uh, we currently have uh, 22 uh, health insurance programs and we are extending to more countries through more partners. Um, to end my presentation, I would like to share with you a video from Ecuador 
uh, captured during the first months of implementation as an illustration of what we propose to our clients, but also to the whole community to generate more impact through the health insurance uh, product that we have uh, in place. So if we can... Yeah. Uh, thank you, Celine. Um, our last speaker is Lida, Lydia, Lydia Wafula. Lydia is the Senior Monitoring Evaluation Research Accountability Officer at Massey Corps Agrifin based in Kenya. Lydia will speak to us on how Massey Corps Agrifin delivers digital solutions such as digital financial services for smallholders farmers who are majority women, leveraging pub public and private partnerships such as fintech, FSPs, among others. She will highlight a climate solution in Tanzania to dem demonstrate the best uh, practices and learnings. Welcome, Lydia. Thank you, Lucy. Um, I would like to build uh, on the on my former presenters who just presented about how women are mostly affected by climate change and some of the solutions we are offering. So this is a case study of a project that we've implemented in Tanzania um, across, uh, which is a country in East Africa. And how we've implemented is that through strategic partnerships with the private sector and governments, uh, Masiko Agrifin program uh, develops digital products and services with and for smallholder farmers with an intentional focus on transforming the livelihoods of women across Kenya, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Uganda. Uh, the digital products um, and services range from uh, climate smart insights, uh, quality inputs and tools, uh, financing and uh, insurance, uh, marketing, um, and uh, facilitation of logistics, uh, just to ensure that uh, all this is aimed at addressing the needs of farmers and contributing to sustainable food systems. So we deliver and engage farmers through digital innovation platforms such as farming applications, mobile applications, uh, interactive voices, videos, SMSs, chat boxes, among others. Um, so going to the project itself, which is now our case study today. Um, so just sharing the experiences as I have indicated, uh, it's a project that was implemented in Tanzania on strengthening climate resilience uh, through digital financial services for smallholder farmers with a special focus on women, uh, on women, sorry. And um, 
the reason why we selected Tanzania was because of the wide digital divide between the men and women uh, that is observed on the ground, uh, because of the diverse agricultural practices uh, that is happening currently in Tanzania, um, and the high impact of climate change and the associated risks uh, to women um, and the young population. Uh, so this project was implemented in partnership with Eka Africa. Eka Africa is a for-profit social enterprise with over 10 years experience in designing um, and delivering risk management solutions for smallholder farmers across Africa. And it uses a wide range of products and approaches just to reach out to the farmers uh, all the way to the rural areas and empower farmers. So this includes design of um, end-to-end -end digital insurance and climate solutions and use of local champions and women farmers to be able to reach out to fellow farmers. So just an overview of the project. Uh, the goal of the project um, was to improve uh, access to crop insurance for smallholder farmers with a particular focus on uh, low income women farmers. And the project aimed at providing smallholder farmers um, engaging in key crop value chains such as coffee, sunflower, maize, um, and tea with access to digital financial services uh, that can help them manage the financial risks and associated um, as risks that come with climate change. So this was done through development of um, a satellite-based weather insurance product uh, called uh, the Lima Salama or Bima Salama. So Lima Salama or Bima Salama is a Swahili word uh, because Swahili is the main national language in, in, in Tanzania. So we wanted to use a term that uh, most of the people, both the men and women are able to relate to. They're able to easily understand without having any technicalities around. And the word simply means smart farming or smart insurance. Uh, so that is the product. So how did we implement it? What, was, what were the strategies? Uh, what worked? What didn't work? And what was the impact? Uh, so just starting with them, um, before we even just started the onset of the project, we held various discussions and planning meetings with key stakeholders um, around Tanzania, uh, including representatives from the relevant government departments in the, from the uh, Department of Agriculture, Environment, Climate, Agenda, uh, from, uh, we also had meetings with the private sector, agro dealers, insurance providers, and definitely farmer representatives, because this was a discussion about them, uh, just to understand the experiences and what has worked for them before, what are the challenges that they are going through to help us design a better program, uh, a better, a better uh, a product that is more inclusive for both the men and women and also the other marginalized groups. Uh, we also conducted a, a human-centered uh, design research just to understand the user journey experiences, the challenges that the women face and the impact that insurance has had in their lives. So the strategies that, um, I'll be talking about were based on the local context, uh, planning meetings that we held, uh, existing local knowledge uh, from both the women and the men, definitely, because they play a key role here. Uh, the challenges that experienced by both the farmers and the digital um, uh, stakeholders that always reach out to the work with the farmers and the data collected throughout the project. So the key strategies that we implemented one was ensuring that we tailored um, an insurance product that is considers the need of both the men and women. Uh, and also, we also formed strong uh, alliances. Uh, the strategic alliances included working with the government just to ensure that there's trust because we noticed that based on the HCD that we did, that there's a lot of mistrust uh, uh, with farmers when various people come in. So just to ensure that there was trust uh, with the farmers, there was also the aspect of, um, um, working with the farmer groups, which was an easy entry point when we were reaching out to the farmers and also to the women. Um, we also ensured that we, uh, through the strong strategic alliances, that also formed um, an aspect of ensuring that we're able to reach more, uh, more uh, farmers and the more women uh, on the ground. We also used cost-effective uh, strategies. This was mostly through the strong uh, alliances and partnership that we created. So it enabled us to reach more women, but at minimal costs. Um, we also 
key was among it was the using of data-driven approaches. So whatever innovations we made, all the discussions and the renovations and the design we made was informed by the monitoring, the continuous monitoring we did, the sex aggregated data that we collected to hear both the men and women, how the experience was and their impact. And of course, doing the um, HCD research that just to ensure that no one is left behind, especially for women, and also to inform the innovations that we made. There was also the aspect of critically building the capacity of all the team members involved. Firstly, including, of course, the ECA Africa team in terms of just ensuring that we are in sync, that uh, business, uh, they are able to understand the business value that women bring in when they're included in, uh, uh, in the engagement. Uh, just uh, being, being trained on the product design, we also worked with the government, just training them in terms of gender and social inclusion, training of farmers definitely, or in terms of digital literacy, which was our key entry point because they had to under to be able at least to be par, to be able to use the basic phone, to be able to understand what they are getting. Um, in terms of training, what is insurance, climate change, and the benefits of uh, insurance. Uh, so with all that, what was the impact really? So the impact is that we were able to reach over 67,000 farmers um, in uh, Tanzania and 55% of them were women. Uh, we were able to obtain a 28% increase on return on investment. And there was a 47% uptake and usage by women farmers, which was quite impressive. And one of the main things is that when we were talking to farmers, we realized that farmers, uh, women farmers mostly, um, were glad that they were able to substantially reduce uh, their financial distress uh, when crops failed. Uh, this is because of the insurance payouts that they received, which was really a much needed buffer for them to able to extend, uh, to expand their farming activities and to reinvest back without thinking, where will I get money? And some of them were able even to use some of the money that remained to be able to take care of their household chores. Um, so after all that, um, uh, Lucy, you're messing up with my slides. Okay. <laughs> I, I want um, you to finish up because of time. <laughs> so yeah, one minute. So the last slide is after the implementation of this uh, product and engaging with the women farmers and the partners that you work with, uh, some of the key lessons that we learned that are very crucial in scaling up similar engagements or working with farmers one of them is we realize sustainable business models is very key. Uh, just ensuring that you are able to put women at the center, ensuring that um, they are not left behind. Uh, they are also cost effective and you also learn in terms of based on their local knowledge and the context that they work in. Investment in human capital is also very key. Just ensuring there's a lot of trainings on digital literacy to cover for the various needs of the women and also to bring them uh, to raise their literacy levels so that they can be able to access and utilize the various digital products and services that we offer. Strong alliances, definitely, it's very key in terms of just using the local administration, the leaders, the government, uh, the farmer groups, uh, the women champions, because women can easily relate to them, the private sector, to build trust, to get that buy-in, and definitely to be able to reach out to a wider scope of people. And lastly, the data-driven uh, data approach, just ensuring that there's continuous monitoring, uh, the reporting use of sex aggregated data uh, to inform implementation strategy, to inform the redesign and restrategizing uh, uh, the initial plans, just to ensure that all this enhances sustainability. Thank you. And over to you, Lucy. And I'm very sorry that I, I moved the slide. I wanted you to finish up so that we can be able to move to question and uh, question sure. and answer session. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, as we wrap up, I will invite um, Nandini to facilitate a question and answer. Then I'll come back and explain more about the case study as we wrap up the session. Thank you so much. What time do we have for Q&A? I think we had hope for 15 minutes, but I'm not sure if we're there right now. How much time do we have? Yeah. We don't have 15 minutes, but maybe we can try our best. 
Okay, sounds good. So I've already pulled a few great questions that have come in from Q and A. Um, thank you so much. Keep coming, and we'll put them up as as much as we can. The first one is a great question for actually th all three of our panelists, which came very early in our session around the the role of identification IDs. So given that women and rural women often one of their great challenges in accessing financial services is having access to an ID. Uh, often that's one of their first basic challenges to even having a digital finance account or accessing a financial service. And so I wanted to invite uh, um, our, our panelists, maybe we start just in sequ sequ sequential order, Lorenzo, uh, Solen, and then Lydia. Can you just give a 30 second to maximum one minute answer to how did, did you face that problem in your implementation? And then um, how did you handle that problem? Lorenzo, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Nandini. Um, yeah, on that question, one of the approaches that OCO is, uh, is adopting is uh, mobile phones and mobile wallets are kind of at the, at the heart of their business model. So that was kind of already uh, there. We didn't uh, get much involved with that, but that means that, for example, also the um, the payouts are generally done through through the mobile wallet of the of the of the smallholder farmers, and that I guess facilitates this this issue because to to open a mobile wallet, like to have a mobile money account, basically, uh, there, there is some um, some uh, some basic uh, uh, assessment that are done, and so. Uh, I, I guess that kind of helped, and that's probably why this issue wasn't wasn't um, didn't appear to be that that critical, at least in in, in our case. Okay, thank you, Lorenzo. Salam. Yeah. Uh, so for us, um, documentation can be the national ID, but we also used um, some alternative documentation, such as family book or locally um, issued notes or refugee ID. Um, I'm thinking about uh, Northern Uganda, where we have a, a program to cover um, the South Sudan refugees um, or, or in Lebanon, for example. So the refugee ID is also something that we accept. So if they don't have any national ID, we accept uh, some alternative documentation. Great, thank you very much. Lydia. Uh, sure. Um, I think for us, it was more of one, the phone numbers, but also using their national identification uh, numbers. So some women definitely did not have uh, IDs, uh, the national identification numbers, but they were able to use their husbands. So there are some that went back, they talked to their husbands and the message that will come in or the registration, they'll know that this message or anything related to the insurance uh, with for the wife, so they'll always take back the message back home and any follow-ups, they'll always um, ensure that the message is delivered to the wife, yeah. Uh, compromise solution, but obviously not the long-term hope, which would be full financial inclusion for women. Um, another question on the board from Alexandra Sanchez, uh, this is specifically for Lorenzo. Apart from training and deploying women agents, in what other ways was the index-based insurance tailored for women? Mm -hmm. So it was mostly, I would say, three three main uh, aspects. So two of them you've already mentioned them. So uh, the the trainings, the training of the insurance agents through a through a gender lens, which, like I said, it could be even relatively simple things. And the second one also was mentioned. Um, it was of course to balance the workforce. And the third point is something that is really unique to index based insurance, like I mentioned, because um, basically Oco. What they did is it's something quite difficult, right? It's it's quite challenging in general to to pilot crop insurance in in a country like Mali. So what they did initially is they went for the kind of easiest thing. Uh, they looked all together in Mali what are um, farmers growing, what are the most grown crops, and it turned out. And so obviously they started prioritizing these crops, and they started prioritizing building insurance products for those crops. And obviously, these crops ended up being crops that are mostly grown by 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 men in Mali, uh, mostly cereals. Uh, but like I said, with index-based insurance, you need to de to design and develop a, a separate crop insurance product for every crop. And so, of course, with that, it, it, there is there is a cost associated to that. And so, what we did uh, together with Oco is, like I said, we um, uh, did an assessment 
specifically targeting women smallholder farmers to really identify what are the main crops that they are growing. And some of them would be similar to the crops grown by men, but really we had peanuts that really standed out. And so we decided to uh, support OCO in the development of our um, insurance products for, for that crop. And that really um, brought some, some important results. So it was really about the, the model, the delivery model, with the agents but also the specific insurance products that uh, you know it's not necessarily just for women it, it's for men as well pro, uh, you know peanut this peanut um, crop insurance but it was designed really uh, with the preferences and the needs uh, of, of women in mind in particular with what is the main crops that they grow thank you very much great answer um, I know we're still limited on time. There's, um, I have a question that's a, a bit of a Getana Gobeze's question. I'm stealing a little bit of his question and, and mixing it with mine as a little cocktail. I hope that's okay. Um, and this is for all three of you. One of the most important things about the work that we're doing with you, with these three members, with the members that Lucy is writing three case studies on is how do we ensure the financial sustainability of these products, right? Um, Getana writes, how do you attract private sector in service provision, including smart subsidies, right? We're paying a little bit of money to maybe do some risk mitigation, get the private sector, see that there is a business model here that's sustainable, and then move it forward, hopefully without our smart subsidy. Um, has that been your experience? Do you think we're there yet? Or do you think it's kind of a, evolution. And then Solen, specifically for you on this question, you, you know, what's been very impressive about this, and Lucy and I were very excited to share this with the members, is you've been able to do this in three regions. That's amazing and, and, and unusual. And so would love to hear what your insights are, you know, across three regions. So maybe Solen, let's start with you. Um, so on the sustainability, I think um, the most important thing is to to have win-win partnership between the private sector, between the, the organization and the, the, the clients or the beneficiaries that we serve. So in terms of insurance, um, it, it's to design a balanced product and, and to bring also a volume in order to uh, lower the, the, the cost of the premium, but also to increase the satisfaction of clients through the number of claims that we can see from the health uh, insurance that we implement. Now, um, uh, implementing across regions. So uh, we we are in four regions actually because uh, we have Latin America, Africa, Asia, but also Middle East because we 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 also operate in Lebanon where Vision Fund is not, but World Vision is, and we are also um, looking at extending to some other organization and MFI in Lebanon and in some other countries. So in four regions, how do we do that? I think we have a global insurance team that can. Um, uh, gather the, so the the experiences that can share the information and 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 provide support technical assistance to to our organization in countries in the other countries in the other regions and and this cross sharing experience cross uh, partner uh, experience is very key um, and, and bring a lot of added value I think even for for new partners who just join us to to um, to to ask for some support and technical assistance to to, to benefit from all these experiences that we have among the, the 25, 26 countries where we are as Vision Fund uh, to, to benefit from the experience of World Vision is all, in almost 100 countries. I think this really helps. And, and yeah, again, win-win partnership for all is, uh, is really key. Thank you. Thank you, Salen. Lydia, um, it looks like we only have one minute left. So Lorenza, I'm gonna skip you if that's okay. Um, and just to ask Lydia, also we have other people in the audience asking you specifically how, you, what is, if you could just name three things, uh, Solen talked about win-win, but maybe be more specific on what is the key to getting that sustainability with private sector beyond our smart subsidies. Um... One, I'll say having um, user-centric uh, product design, just ensuring that you conduct in-depth gender-specific market research that informs the development and design of uh, all these um, projects. Two is to ensure that we have um, a, a great, can I say like a, a great business uh, field force or agent model uh, that Absolutely. literally the partners or the 
private sector can always ride on because that is always cost effective and it's something that even as an implementation ends and if another partner comes in, they'll always use the same. So you're already setting systems already in the field within the communities that can always be ridden upon by whatever partnership. Um, another thing I will say, of course, is always um, have uh, gender uh, partnerships, uh, not just partnerships, in one sector or so, but have widespread partnerships across the different sectors. Because as much as we have women or climate change or women empowerment, uh, other aspects or other sectors always come in. Financial inclusion comes in, extension comes in. Uh, people in the mobile network also come in. So have this network of partners that every person, instead of reinventing the, a new wheel, always have all these people that have already done, tested, failed or worked where you can always borrow or always you can always ride on and build up upon. So those will be my key three takeaways just to ensure great partnership and sustainability of that. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you, Lydia. And also the emphasis on agent networks was shared by Lorenzo as well. So I like this overlapping themes and learnings. Um, it's been a pleasure to co-facilitate this. I'm going to throw it back to Lucy and to wrap it up. Thank you so much. Uh, once again, thank you, Lorenzo, Soline, Lindia, for your great presentation today. And I'm very sorry that you're extending with five minutes. Please allow me just to give you the next steps of what we will be doing uh, in the next step on climate smart solution, uh, gender and financial inclusion. Uh, to you, our participants, we we could not have earned this great session or this are not convening without you being part of our discussion. We appreciate your organizational and individual initiative efforts towards building women resilience in these times of climate change. Thank you to you, to Nandini, for being an excellent co-facilitator, and to Finiquity and SIGAP and all our funders for organizing this event. At Finiquity, we'll continue to share knowledge, new knowledge, experiences, identify new challenges, documenting and discussing good practices that are geared towards women economic empowerment. In our next type, step, uh, steps, as I mentioned when we are starting, we are writing three case studies focused on climate smart solution that will be available in, on our platform. Uh, with the first case study, we are documenting it with insurance designed and delivered for women working in the informal sector in India, collaborating between a collaboration between Blue Mabo and Siwa. The second case study is based on how village enterprise, not for profit, profit organization, are utilizing ultra poor graduation model in partnership with development partners through innovation, training, and women entrepreneurship uh, development. Then the last case uh, is TechnoLink Plus project implemented by Minda, showcasing our financial incentives incentive through uh, matching grants can be used to support women, small older farmers, agribusiness and cooperative, leading to better uh, bottom lines for business and greater job uh, creation. I encourage everyone to be on the lookout in March once they get published. And finally, we have our regional Africa event coming up in March 14 in Ethiopia, where we'll be launching these case studies. Please, if possible, register through our website to be part. I encourage you all to fill out uh, our feedback poll. And we are looking forward to hosting you again tomorrow from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern time. Asante Nisana, see you tomorrow.